Welcome. Uh, welcome to our webinar for this Monday and welcome to Matt Reiner from K15T, who is joining us today from upstate New York. So good morning to the United States. Um, and he will tell us how to create awesome technical documentation in conference. And with that, Matt, over to you um, and your presentation. And I right. will disappear. Well, thank you, thank you. The last ACE that I got to speak to was New York City in January, and then I didn't leave my house. Um, so it's great to talk to another group. I hope you all are well. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Matt Reiner. I'm from K15T. And today I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how do you make really good technical documentation in Confluence? Um, just a little bit about me. I'm a customer advocate at K15T, so I have a really fun job. I get to talk to people who use our apps or who might wanna use our apps and just see what are their teams looking to do? How can I help them do that? Um, one of the great things about this job is um, I used to be a customer of K15Ts before I worked with the team. So um, I have a lot of perspective there. Um, so I can have really great conversations around like, do our apps work for you? Do they not? Um, what's the best fit? So to talk about making documentation in Confluence, a great way to start is actually to go back to my last job as a tech writer, um, the lone tech writer at my company, actually. Um, I had this legacy tech writing app that was installed on my uh, laptop and I would, you know, the team would give me uh, the recent code and they would say, hey, we built something, go document it. By the way, we're releasing soon, so you better hurry. It was a waterfall approach, um, but it seemed to work for our team since I was the only person really doing any of the documentation. Um, but we found that it was taking a really long time to ship releases, right? So the team decided, let's move to an agile process. And so with the agile process, the idea was we would move through these different phases of product or uh, of, of process, product development all together uh, as a team. So we would have better transparency and we could develop things much, much faster than the waterfall approach that we were coming out of. And this worked really well for most of the team, right? We were using Jira and uh, Bitbucket and we had these tools that were available to everyone online. We were collaborating. Um, it was really great, uh, but there was a big problem and that was my part of the process, the technical writing. It was all still stuck in this legacy app on my laptop. Um, I couldn't get feedback from people. The only thing I could do was share PDFs with them and you just don't make friends when you send them a PDF that's four pages long and I ask them to review it and give you feedback. So I was set on that, out on the task to find a better tool and that's actually where I discovered Confluence, which I was amazed by this tool that we could all work on together to create content. We could render dynamic content. I thought this was like the perfect tool for so many things, but I was just sort of curious, could this do technical writing, right? We, you know, we can certainly create um, different specs or other things the team makes, but can we do proper technical writing? See, there's these different tasks that technical writers need to do that are a little bit beyond, you know, your typical content creation practices. So the first question was why Confluence? Why Confluence above any other tech writing option out there? Is this tool really going to work for us? Can we create topics? I'll talk a little bit more about what topics are, but this is like a, a uh, a keystone for um, how technical writing is done. What about collaboration? Is it really that good in Confluence? Or content reuse? I need to be able to write content once and reuse it across a, a vast collection of content. Or conditional content, so based on uh, maybe my audience or the variant of my software they're using, can I write specific documentation for users? Or what about versioning, right? We've released 1.0, I need to write the documentation for 2.0, but I need to be able to do it in a controlled way. What about multilingual, right? As our app grows, I need to be able to author content in multiple languages, working with translators. Can I do that in Confluence? And then of course, publishing. How do I share my content with my audience once it's ready? So these were the questions that I had in my mind and the answer is yes, we can do all these things. Um, so let's look at each of them together. So the, the first question, right? Why, why Confluence of all the tools? Well, it starts with the ease of use, 
was really amazed with the simplicity of the Confluence editor um, and how quickly I could get even an untrained technical writer in there and working on things. Um, many tech writing tools have a very, very complex editor and you often need to switch back into or switch into the background language like XML to fix structure because the editors often kind of um, enable you to break things. Also really liked the collaboration in, in Confluence, right? We have spaces where we can together group content. Uh, we can write content together using the collaborative editor. We had the ability to comment both inline and at the bottom of pages, share content with each other, and then use notifications to, to, to pull people into my content when I needed their help. Also availability was a big deal for us. Um, the fact that we could have our own server or even data center instance and um, you know, scale that as, as large as we needed. Also constant updates. So both for Confluence and the apps we were using, as a non-developer, I continually saw things get better with more features. Whereas most other tech writing setups, you have to hire a consultant and things tend to break over time versus getting better. Um, and then of course, scalability is cool. Um, and I only later found out when I was working at K15T that there are very, very, very large instances of Confluence. Um, so you can really spread it across your whole organization and use it for more than just technical writing. Um, as I mentioned, apps are a huge difference. Any other tech writing tool, they kind of ship with the features they have and that's it. But with Confluence, with over a thousand apps, as a tech writer, I can say, hey, I really want to have, I don't know, a macro that shows or hides content based on uh, what a user clicks, right? There is a macro for that, there's an app for that. Um, that was incredibly powerful for me and that helps a lot of teams that don't have development resources uh, customize their documentation in really cool ways. So some examples that were really convincing to me was Atlassian themselves. So they use our scroll uh, versions and scroll viewport apps to build their help center and to theme it. Uh, BMC is another customer of ours who use our scroll translations app to provide multiple languages of their content. And then Eagle is another customer who uh, really built a custom theme here to help their users focus on the topics they were most interested in. So speaking of, let's talk about topics. So in the tech writing world, a topic is sort of, uh, I think of it as a page of content that's structured in a certain way. So common types of topics are uh, concept topics. So that's typically linear. Uh, you're describing what a thing is. Uh, there may be some pictures or diagrams. You might have reference topics, which are often tabular. So maybe it's a table or just a bulleted list of many different just pieces of information that are useful. There's procedures or task topics, which are often uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five steps on how to accomplish something. So these types of topics help us format our content in certain ways and then reuse that content in, in different combinations. So the way you create topics in Confluence is using Confluence templates. And one of the great things about them is you can create them to sort of give guidance to users. So, right, so I've created a few different uh, templates here for my team to get started with. Um, and I really love instructional text because in some tech writing tools, you have to lock down what people are allowed to write and what they're not. With instructional text, you kind of, you give guidance, right? You say, this is what should be here. And then as people type, that disappears and they can start creating you know, whatever suits them. There's also template variables. I think it's a cool feature. I've used it a few times for templates, but um, on average, I haven't seen an incredible use case for it, but it's nice to know they're there. Um, but the biggest power with templates is you can provide suggestions for how things should be written. Um, often when you think about writing tech writing, it's like, oh, I have to memorize uh, an entire uh, style guide to understand how exactly they format their content. But instead, I have instructions right within here. So it says, here's what you should make. Here's, you know, here's what it should look like. This is how long it should be. Uh, just to get people going as quickly as possible. Found that to be huge. Then there's dynamic content, right? So macros are an incredibly powerful thing that set Confluence apart from any other tech writing tool that I've seen. Um, and for example, right, the children display macro, the fact that I can just drop something on a page and it will 
dynamically build a list of all child pages exactly where I put it, that would cost so much money to hire a consultant to add a feature like that in any other tech writing app that's out there. And then labels. So these are really great for um, a tech writer or a team of tech writers who are trying to organize content in different ways. Maybe you add labels about what the content is about or when it's created. Um, it's really nice to have that system sort of in the background to help manage everything. And then media. So this might seem kind of crazy, but in a lot of tech writing apps, it's hard to add images and to control the sizing of them. So the fact you can just drop an image in, set the size, um, you can put it in a, a show hide macro. So you can have uh, images that only display when users are interested in them. That's an incredibly powerful feature for most tech writers. Um, and then also you can add alt text. So alt text is really important for um, accessibility for those who are using screen readers and also for SEO. So if Google comes across an image that doesn't have alt text, it's going to devalue that in search results quite a bit actually. Um, also, you can drop videos into documentation. Again, this may seem simple if you're used to Confluence, but in most other apps, this is very difficult to do. Uh, but this really helps teams, you know, maybe something's better communicated with a video. You can very quickly add it to YouTube, drop it in your documentation, and it's ready to go. And then another powerful thing is diagrams. So using apps like Draw.io or Gliffy, teams can create diagrams right in Confluence. The content is, is uh, right there, managed with the same versions, and it's rendered dynamically. So if it's viewed on a mobile device, it looks good. If it's on a huge screen, uh, it also looks good. This is great because teams uh, don't have to go off, draw their diagram in Visio, export it as a PNG, upload it to Confluence, um, hopefully they don't forget to do that whole process again when somebody makes a small change. All of it is there in Confluence, rendered dynamically. Uh, it saves so much time and it keeps all the content in one spot. So another really important thing that is great about Confluence, but most teams are lacking, is collaboration. Um, so feedback was one of the drivers for me looking for a new tool and I found that in Confluence. So, uh, whether it's the comment stream at the bottom, which is often great for larger ideas and more discussion about the topic that you're reviewing or the page, um, or if it's that inline commenting, which was really a game changer for my team, drawing people's attention to a very specific area and saying, hey, you know, subject matter expert, I just wrote this, is this technically accurate? Or, you know, hey, maybe person in marketing, I just use this terminology. Does this align with what you're thinking? Being able to pull subject matter experts in, they get in, add a thought and get out. That was incredible. And my team really loved Confluence for that reason. And then of course there's like the sharing, right? So if I need to bring someone's attention to something, I can very quickly share a link with them. Um, the ability to use the collaborative editor at first seemed like a gimmick to me. Um, it was nice to be able to have people work together, but I wondered what was the real value. Uh, but then what I found is it's very great for training uh, in documentation because when you're teaching people to, to write documentation, you do have some standards and you do have certain ways you talk about things. So with a collaborative editor, I could sit down with someone new and very, very quickly uh, write with them. Uh, just like you would do a, a pair code review, you can also do a pair documentation review and pair, pair writing, which is a really, really cool uh, opportunity. And then there's workflow. So if you're using scroll versions, you get a basic workflow, and this is great for teams who want to keep track of for each page, are we still drafting this? Is it under review by our uh, subject matter experts or is it ready to be published? And then of course you can build really extensive workflows with Kamala. This is not a great example here, but you, you know, you could have a 10 step process with um, several people who are required to review it with date stamps on when they do. Um, this is very important for teams writing documentation in regulated environments where you need your safety team to take a look at the new warning that you wrote or your legal team to review to make sure there's no claims that would be, uh, you know, negative for the company. 
So then there's content reuse. And this is where things get really interesting and very powerful. So the concept of content reuse is I write one thing, but I know I need to use this. I'm gonna write the same thing across all of my documentation. So I could copy and paste it into six to 12 to, to 200 different places, or I could reuse that content. So the way we do this in Confluence is using macros. So the first type of content reuse is using short descriptions. And a short description in tech writing is really just a short description of what the topic is. So in this example, I'm using an excerpt macro. Um, I typically recommend add an excerpt macro on the top of every page and in a short uh, one to two sentences, maybe a paragraph, describe what the page is and what the page does. Um, having those on every page becomes very, very powerful because you can do things like this. So that same children display macro I mentioned earlier, you can turn on excerpts. So it will display those excerpts um, when the list of links is rendered. And that's really great because then users can not only see a link that they can click, but they can also see a description of that page. Um, that becomes very, very powerful over time as you build up a huge collection of content. You can do really, really cool content things like this with no effort at all. Then you take it to the next step. So maybe you have other things more than just descriptions of pages. Then you can build what you would call an inclusion library. Um, so this chunk of content here, you can see is a list of steps. So one through four, I've put these on a page in Confluence and I gave the page a very unique name so I can identify, okay, this is a task piece of content and this is what the task accomplishes, right? Adding an item to the equipment inventory. Then I can group these uh, just within a Confluence space um, in what I call a collection. That's not an official term. I just like to call it that. And basically it's my collection of all of my reusable task um, chunks of content. And then you end up with something like this, where you have a whole hierarchy within a space of all these different types of content um, that your team can and a good naming scheme. So what my team can do now is um, I can add that content to a page. So using the include page macro or the include plus macro, if you're using scroll versions, um, I can go to the space where my content is. I can select that piece of content I want to include and I can insert it. And that means everywhere I put that piece of content, um, in this example, it's a legal notice. So it might be on a lot of pages. My viewers will see that content. Um, in the, it, it, here I can see um, I'm using scroll versions. So not only do I see the content when I'm viewing the page, but also as an author, I can hover over it. I can see where is the content coming from? What space does it live in? And I can also see a report of where is this used across all of my Confluence instance in case I need to update those references or something. So you can see how that becomes exponentially uh, powerful the more content you reuse. The next big thing is conditional content. So that is um, creating multiple sets of content for different use cases. So a good example is on Atlassian's website, they have documentation for Confluence Cloud and Confluence Server. Some of that documentation is shared, it's the same, but some of it is different. And so they have two different variants of that content. So there's a few different ways you can manage this. Some of them just with vanilla Confluence, some of them with our app. So I figured I'd mention all of them. Um, one approach is you can have separate spaces for each variant, right? Maybe, maybe you have three different audiences like users, administrators, and, um, and developers. So maybe you have three different spaces and you just write the content in that way. That's great because users can go to different places based on what they're interested in, but the challenge is your content's totally separate. So you might have a lot of uh, duplicated content across the spaces. Another thing you can do is you can hide the content. So you could use different macros that are available um, or third-party apps perhaps to sort of uh, say, this content is for admins, this is for users, this is for developers. Um, that can work sometimes, but it does put a lot of burden on users to know um, which things should they be looking at. But the benefit there is you do have all of the content in one space, which helps you uh, reduce duplication. You could also, um, for example, if you're using our scroll PDF exporter app, if all you care about is having unique content that is 
put into the PDF versus displayed in Confluence, there are macros so you can just separate that content um, if that's all you're looking to do. But for really advanced use cases, we have the conditional content feature in scroll versions. So for this, you can have multiple variants of content within a single space. So the way that works is you build attributes. So in this case, I'm building a, the audience attribute and I can have multiple value, values for developers, administrators, and users. And then when I'm editing in the editor here, I use these conditional content macros to say, hey, this chunk of content is only applicable to administrators and developers using iOS and this one to the same audience using Android. So you can, you can write all the content on a single page, but then you decide who should see this and who should not. And this isn't just for pieces of content on a page, it could also be for an entire page. So uh, in this example, my guide for setting up your IDE, it only applies to uh, developers. So this won't even display for other, um, other users who are viewing it. So then when you put this, um, you know, maybe out on your help center, you would just have a drop down list where users can say, oh, I'm, I'm an administrator. I want to see content for administrators. So again, that can be a really powerful experience. Um, then we get to versioning. I'm just looking at a question here from Frank. Um, he's asking about page includes. Is there a way to track down pages that are included using standard Confluence functionality? There isn't that I know of. Um, one recommendation in that um, approach, if you're not using scroll versions, is you could on your main page where you just have your chunk of content, you could have a page properties macro there where you keep a running list of links to all the pages where you've reused that content or included it, I should say. Um, it's not a great approach, but that is one way. Then you do have sort of that running list that you can uh, reference back to. It just requires a very strict process by your team and some extra work every time you include something. Yeah, great question. So versioning, um, this is really important, right? Maybe the team, like I said, has released 1.0. That documentation is live on the help center. We need to be able to author the content for version 2.0 but also I need to be able to maybe modify 1.0. Maybe I need to fix uh, typos or, or something like that. So I need kind of a separation of concerns. So the way this is done um, is really, we have to look at how changes are managed in Confluence. So by default, right, you might think, oh, it already has versioning. Um, it has that page history area, which is basically where you can see what changes have been made over time. You can revert back to previous changes. Um, it's helpful, but it doesn't do any kind of content restriction, right? It doesn't keep, as soon as you hit save on a page, it's live. Um, whereas what scroll versions provides is a space wide version. So you can, create your 2.0 version, make changes across all the pages in the space, and then release all those changes as a version all at the same time. So it's, it's much more than just on a page level, it's an entire space level, and it gives you that um, control over when you're sharing your content with users. So there's a few ways to do this um, if you're not using scroll versions. One way that I've seen teams do that is they just have a bunch of different spaces, spaces. And, and you know, you have your 1.0 space and then you copy that and that becomes 2.0 and you copy that and it becomes 2.1 and then you copy 2.0 and that becomes 3.1. But you can see how that can get a little messy because you have your content duplicated and then also, you know, you have to manually copy and paste to make changes on multiple versions. Uh, but, but some teams are doing that. Another option is you can have one public space, uh, which is great because your users only have to know one URL um, to go read the documentation. And then you maybe manually or use a third party app to copy content from one or more private spaces um, that you use to manage each of the versions. Um, again, sort of a downside with that is you are still authoring in multiple spaces. So you're copying and pasting all of the content. So that can get messy. Another approach I've seen is you can author all of the content in the same space that users are reading the documentation in. So the way you do this is say you have a page that you want to modify. You make a copy of that page 
place it under the page in the hierarchy and then restrict it so only you can see it. Make the content changes you want and then when the day comes when you want to publish this page and however many other pages, you copy the content out of the new page, paste it into the original page, uh, and then delete your copy. So it's a lot of manual work, but you can see how at least you're keeping all your content in a single space and it's the same space that users are reading in. Um, so a lot of manual work, but I have seen teams do that as well. And then finally, there is the approach of using scroll versions, which lets you multi uh, manage those multiple versions in a single space uh, much more uh, gracefully. So the way this works is scroll versions adds a version picker. So when you're going to write your content, content you pick, oh, hey, I'm writing a, a feature that's for the new 3.0 version. So I'm going to write it there. Um, you set up your versions, uh, you know, either very liter linearly or God forbid we have to do a bug fix. So you can also do that, you know, 2.1 release. Um, it also has an inheritance model. So that means if I make a change in 2.0, maybe we have a new feature, um, that content will not affect um, version 1.0 because that feature does not exist in 1.0. Um, also, that change will bubble up. So it will also be available in 3.0 because that feature still exists in 3.0. So that inheritance concept helps keep straight um, your documentation and keeps it in line with your product functionality. And then also there's some built-in reports so you can see what's in each version. Uh, you can compare different versions, what's changed between the two, and you can reschedule content if you need to. So maybe the team thought you were gonna release a feature and then you weren't able to, you can take those changes you've made for different pages and reschedule them to a future version. All right, let me take a look at some of our questions here. So uh, someone asked, how do you handle variables? Uh, for, for example, space, uh, specs or feature names. So in that case, you would add those in your include library. So it, it would be a page maybe with a single word on it, maybe your product name. And then you would use that in conjunction with the um, variant functionality. So you can, you know, maybe you want to white label your product. And so um, different people are using the same product, but with a different name. And so you create three variants of the name. So then when users go to the uh, help site for product A, um, they view the, the documentation for that variant. And so they would see that variant of the name, which is the variant of the value on the page that's in your inclusion library. Um, if that explanation doesn't make sense, you should reach out to me and I will show you what I mean because it's, it's hard to explain it. It's easy to see it though. With scroll versions, is it possible to have a review task list? Um, like does a page need to be adjusted or can it just include the page from the last version before the new one? Uh, last version before the new one. I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Um, there, is, there are, workflows like I mentioned so you can see what pages are in review. Um, I believe there's a report that helps you visualize that definitely if you're integrating Kamala. Um, also you may also be asking about um, if you don't change a page is that page um, included in the version? Uh, the answer is as long as you don't make a change um, that won't be shown in the report typically. You can show those, but uh, often you would want to filter that kind of change out. Let me know if I, I didn't answer that. I probably didn't, but I'm a little confused on that question. Sorry. Um, are there any best practices for translation workflows? Um, yes, let's talk about that. We'll, we'll get back to that question. All right, so languages. Let's talk about languages right now since we're, we're on the subject. So, with languages, um, just like with these other approaches, you could manage them a few different ways without any apps. So the first would be, um, you know, your multiple translations of content on the same page, and then your users have to sort of skim through and find their language. Um, it's, oh, it's okay, not a great user experience, um, but we also find that's very confusing to search engines because they don't really know 
what's the actual language of the content. If a user searches for the uh, content in Korean, are they going to find the results? Because Google, for example, thinks the, you know, the text is in English. Another approach is you could have separate spaces for each language. Um, so users know, oh, I, you know, I want the Japanese translation, I'm going to go to the Japanese space. The challenge there, and as you've probably guessed with these other approaches, is if you have a separate space for every language and then every version and every variant, you can have just an exponential number of different spaces with all the different variations. So that can become very complicated. So solution there is, um, scroll translations app that we make, which lets you author multiple languages in a single space. So with that, your author gets to pick a source language. So uh, let's say our source language is English. So we write all of our content as we would normally in English, uh, right in the Confluence editor. And then we can take a look at, okay, what pages need to be translated? Um, and which ones have already been translated. Now, in this case, you, you can see all of them need to be translated because I just enables scroll translations. So now I can do my translation work right here in the editor based on that report. So I can, you know, kind of work through, do all of the translations. Um, that's a tedious process right at the beginning because everything needs to be translated. Or we also support export into the XLIF file format which is an industry standard translation format. So you can import that into a third party translation management system or work with a third party translator so that you can translate all of the content in that system and import it back into Confluence. So we see different teams doing things in different ways. Sometimes, um, you know, a best practice is when you first turn translations on, if you have a full space that already includes a ton of content, you may want to export that and do it in a translation management system just because of the vastness of the content. But then later on, especially if you're doing the translations in house, if you're making incremental updates on your different pages, you might just want to do that within Confluence because maybe the updates are not nearly as major as when you first um, turn the app on. So let me know if, uh, if that does not answer your question. Um, we have another question on uh, a feature for marking pages. Um, check before publish if the feature is live or should be hidden. Um, so, uh, or, and as an example, labels. So the closest we have to that would be our workflow feature. So you can see in any of our reports, you can see what do the feature or um, what pages have been changed and then what's the status of those pages. So, okay, these pages are in review, so they're not ready to be published. These pages are marked as, you know, ready to publish. And the same is true if you're using Kamala, you can look at any of the Kamala reports and see which ones are in process. Now, I have used labels in the past for something like that more manually, but it's not really, uh, it's not part of the scroll versions app. It's not really integrated with it. So it's sort of up to you as you approach publishing time to decide um, if your content is ready to go based on the status that the pages are in. All right, keep the questions coming. I'll, I'll keep talking. Yeah, keep, keep asking, please. So the last big area is publishing. So you probably heard of single source publishing or um, multi, uh, multi media publishing. Basically, how do I write something in Confluence and get it out to my users in multiple different ways? So there are lots of different options with Confluence. So the first is online. So you know, say you've written stuff in Confluence and you just wanna get it out there to people, Built right into Confluence is a feature called anonymous access, which um, always scares administrators, but it's really not as scary as it may seem. You can take a space um, and make it accessible on the internet. Um, that doesn't mean all your spaces are, just that one. Um, this is great because you can really quickly get your content out there and people can read it. The downside is it looks like Confluence. So it's not a great experience. Users. 
um, might be looking for a help center and they're going to find a confluence space. So, you know, that's great, especially when you're in alpha or beta, um, but eventually people are looking for a little bit more user-friendly experience. Um, you could use the built-in HTML exporter to get the content out, um, but as you can see, it's very, very basic. So you're gonna have to do a lot of work to build a proper site around that. Uh, we make a scroll HTML exporter, which does a full HTML export, uh, but that includes a, a search index, uh, a full theme that you can customize, um, nav navigation, it's mobile responsive, right? This is really great for situations where maybe your users are working behind a firewall, uh, like for example, in a bank, maybe they don't have access to the internet. And so you could drop this on a server on their side or release it as part of your app um, and they have access to web-based documentation that way. Another option is releasing it as a help center. This is the approach that Atlassian uses, this is the approach we use, um, and this is using our app Scroll Viewport. So what Scroll Viewport does is it renders all the same content that's in Confluence right in your spaces, but it renders it as a help center here. So um, the content is loaded into our theme, which your team can customize with settings, or you can use your web development uh, skills and write a totally custom theme like Atlassian did. Uh, but the, the goal here is that teams can write and collaborate in Confluence, and then very quickly share it out without having to have development knowledge um, and create a really nice help center experience. Uh, maybe your users want documents. I know we're moving away from that slowly, but some people just want a document in their hand or on their iPad. So you could use the simple document export from, uh, that's built right into Confluence. That might be all you need. If people are looking for more, you could use one of our scroll PDF or Word exporter apps, which have a full um, interface where you can build a theme for your document. So you can brand it, add custom table of contents and title page, a table uh, or a header and footer so that it looks you know, it looks like it comes from your organization. It looks exactly the way you want. There's also um, so, sort of a newer uh, option that we're really excited about, and that's context sensitive help. So um, with a new update to scroll viewport, you can now add like an iframe to your application and you can request a simplified version of the content that's on your online help center. So it'll just be the text and the images and whatnot. Um, and then you can even specify, hey, you know, I want, based on what my user is, I want this version of content and this variant because they're an administrator. And then you can embed links to this all throughout your app. So you can um, use this link and really create a fantastic user experience. Uh, we've just started doing this with some of our apps, um, especially our cloud apps. And we're really excited about what teams are going to do with bringing their help out of the help center, out of the document, and actually right into their app instead. All right, so I have a question here. Uh, the help center, does it include a feedback feature like a net promoter score? So at this point, it does not. Um, if you're writing a totally custom theme, you could include something like um, discuss or um, another one that's really popular that I've done in the past or Atlassian does, you could drop in a JIRA issue collector. So um, people can, with a click of a link at the bottom of your page, give you feedback and say, hey, this is good, this needs to be improved, and it will create a JIRA issue for you. That, that's really great for some teams' workflows. Um, we've been looking into some of the apps on the marketplace that do this also to see how we could integrate them into that help center theme that we have, which is um, meant for those teams that don't have web development skills. But at this point, um, we don't have anything in the works, but we're still keeping our eyes out on that. But good question, good feedback. So let me wrap this up and then we'll just keep talking questions. So, so can Confluence do proper tech writing? Can it do all of the powerful things that tech writers need? Yes, yes, it definitely can. Um, and if you would like to know more about it, if you feel like I skimmed over it, I definitely did. Um, but we have a microsite called Rock the Docs, which has, it's full of best practices on how teams can write technical content in Confluence. Um, so head over there to find um, more on everything I talked about, plus 
additional thoughts on doing documentation in an agile environment. So other questions, let's see. Um, is the context sensitive feature only available in the help center or is it also available in the HTML export? Um, it's also available in the HTML export as far as I'm aware. And then with documents, what you would do, you know, if you, if you wanna maybe export a PDF that's the administrator's guide for an app, um, you can switch to that variant uh, right in Confluence and then you just hit the export button and that will create your PDF for you. Yeah, yeah, we really, we keep the apps working together as much as possible. All right, other questions or concerns or criticisms? Let me just get back online because now I guess I can uh, promote everybody to panelists. That's the end of your slides, yes? Yes. Okay, so let's put everybody on the panel. And once you are on the panel, you can open your audio and video and ask directly or just continue using the Q&A box. So I have a question. Uh, when we talk about technical documentation uh, and especially in software development, um, how do you integrate, synchronize something like your Git flow in, into your versioning app? Is that possible? So I'm let's glad you, my, yeah. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I have a release version in my Git um, and uh, I want to mirror that version in my Confluence documentation. I, I'm glad that you asked because I was going to bring it up if you didn't. I know you, you had asked me prior to this. So this whole um, docs as code, you know, integrating, developing your content right with the same process as developing your code. Um, we're not at a point with our apps where, you know, you're gonna be able to, for example, um, write your API docs using open API um, within your code, and then that's going to be pulled into our apps. Um, we're not there yet. There's a, you know, complete disconnect from your content that's in Git and what's living in Confluence today. Um, but what we see is most teams are synchronizing using JIRA. So they're using their process they built in JIRA to know, you know, what, have we documented everything and when are we releasing everything? So for example, my team, uh, my last team, for every development issue we created that, uh, that affected user experience, we also created a documentation issue. So I would you know, on working on the same board with the development team, I would ensure whatever change they made was documented. Then leading up to review or uh, to release, I could review all of those issues and ensure that they were all included in my upcoming version. And then when we had the uh, JIRA issue to do the release, you know, to push the code from Bitbucket, I would then um, manually publish our docs. Um, we also have an API, so we could have written an automation. So when we push the big red button, it would also public our, publish our docs, um, but we didn't, we didn't get that far with it. Um, we, I have been talking to a few users who are using, um, there are a few macros out there for rendering open API type docs. Um, I've, I've heard mixed reviews on them. They all kind of just look like the same swagger UI, but we definitely have our eyes on it. Um, as something like sort of a next area that we want to pursue because we know that a lot of teams want to do, you know, closer to closer to the text editor type documentation work. They want to do more with um, API docs. And honestly, a lot of tech writers like um, straight up tech writers are asking for it because to be honest, there's more money in documenting uh, code, right? It, to documenting APIs than maybe user guides. So. Definitely something we're keeping our eyes on. Um, and another question from my side, you mentioned um, using Jira. Uh, is there any way to trigger workflows in your apps from Jira or the other way around from a Jira workflow? So let's say I've closed all the issues in an Epic uh, and that closes the version or something like that. Can I do that with script runner or something else? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I'm trying to think. You could definitely do it with Script Runner. We have a, a full Java API um, that you could use to trigger things. So you can trigger events like publish a version, create a new version, um, create a translation, all those types of actions. So I'm just, you could maybe even do it with a web hook because there's also some REST API support. You can definitely do it. I, d I don't have a recommended way. Yeah, if you're ready to do it, you're, uh, you tell me and I'll get you in touch with one of our engineers and he'll tell you exactly how. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yes. So there, but there would even be several ways to do that. So not only one, yeah. so you have a script runner and the API and whatnot. Perfect. Exactly. Um, yeah. Other questions from the audience? You can open your audio and ask directly. Um, or you can even open your video and we can see you then. Questions? Uh, I see a question in the chat about page history. Um, oh. Is it available to show that when and how many times a page was edited? No, 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 no. it's not a question. Um, hi, Matt. Uh, basically, oh. you were explaining about the page. Uh, somebody was asking about a question. So you can, if you go to a, uh, the three dots on the uh, components page, you do have a page history that will give uh, detailed information as to when someone made the changes and uh, how you can go back or revert back to changes or delete them if you choose to. I see, I see, all right. Thank you, yes, that's, the, yeah, page history is, yes, it's hidden away in a menu, but it's a very useful feature. And that kind of builds on top of what scroll version offers with space wide versions. So you have your space wide version and then you can see each page, what's changed in that. Um, yeah, but that becomes very useful, especially if you've accidentally done something you shouldn't have with a page, you can roll back that change, very useful. Okay, questions from the audience. Once again, question. Or oh, I will keep asking, I have two left something. Okay, All right. another question from me. Um, so we have been basically told every week for the last two months now that uh, the cloud is the future and we all have to migrate to Atlassian Cloud. Um, so the question for you would be, do you have any experiences already with migrating all the data that you collect in versions and scroll office and all that to cloud environments? Uh, so how, how easy is that to switch from server to cloud and preserve all the versioning information and all that stuff? That's another good question. So I would say the cloud is the future. Um, we've had a lot of a lot of meetings in the last few months focusing on nothing but the cloud. In fact, we we talked about you know more Git support and closer to Docs as code support. That's kind of waiting right now because the main focus is cloud. So today it would be we can't offer the same kind of feature set on cloud because we don't have a scroll versions for cloud. So you lose that ability to do versioning um, and variants. We did just release scroll viewport for cloud. So at least you can have that same help center experience, but we are looking deeply into it. So we're doing a lot of user research right now and beginning our journey toward cloud. Um, and part of that is having a migration strategy trying to find out what are the features that people are using the most in scroll versions so that we could help them make that jump. Um, and it's especially difficult because scroll versions has been around since 2014, I think. Yeah. So we have a lot of features in there. So finding what are the ones that people really need, um, you know, to have the minimum lovable product. That's what we're considering right now. So if you're looking today to migrate from uh, scroll version server, I would say don't. But if you're looking toward the future, um, you can know that we are also. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I may be so bold to ask a uh, roadmap ballpark, 12 months, a year, next week. <laughs> <Where are you? laughs> you may be so bold and our product manager is no longer working so I can say whatever okay. I want, right? Um, so we're really looking at by the end of the year to have something as, as however small as it may be. And we want it to integrate with, with scroll viewport for cloud. So at least teams can, you know, have some kind of basic versioning and be able to get it 
out to people. That seems like the biggest need that everybody has is have something live on the internet, be able to work on something private or, you know, privately the next version or whatever. So that's what we're, we're really aiming for. And um, what we have by Q4, you know, it might be a lump of coal. It might be a diamond. That part I can't speak to yet. Okay. But we're excited okay. about it. But safe to say we can issue another invitation by the beginning of next year and, uh, and the world please, should be clearer by then. So please do, please do. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, because we are going to continue till the end of the year and pick it up in January again, so we want to do one talk every week to, I don't know, the end of time, if possible. All right. <laughs> All right. And who knows, maybe someday I'll actually be able to be in Germany again and, you know, yeah, exactly. we can and then have a picnic. And then we do that as a, in a studio atmosphere and you can visit me in my living room and we record it there. So <laughs> okay, other questions from the audience? Because I'm done, actually. I have all the answers, perfect. Going once, going twice, and gone. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank you, Matt, for the presentation and for bravely answering all the questions that, that were a lot of questions. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we will see you again in, I don't know, February or something to <laughs> tell us all good. about the diamonds that you <laughs> created in the meantime. Um, just a short thing about our next event. Um, Julia Johnson will be with us next week. He, she is a certification leader at Atlassian. So uh, if you ever wanted to know how to build a career with Atlassian certification, she's the woman to meet and to ask questions about that because she's basically queen of all certifications at Atlassian. So, um, and she will be with us next Monday. Um, so with that, again, Matt, thank you very much. Have a nice day because it's still early where you are. Um, stay healthy and um, see you soon with diamonds on the soles of your shoes or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a so, good evening, everyone.